Hi, everyone, and welcome to the first official episode of Lunch and Learn as a part of our new Lead Learning Online series, which we debuted yesterday. I'm Brenda Zulman, an intern with the Lead Center's Education Department, and I'm joined today by my co-host and fellow intern, Ryan Savage. Hi, Ryan. Um, we are super excited to present this new virtual series to you all, and we're looking forward to spending your lunch breaks with you on the first Tuesday of every month at noon. In each Lunch and Learn episode, we'll touch on a broad range of topics regarding the art scene here in Lincoln and the arts industry as a whole. Today, we'll be talking about all things Hamilton as Lin-Manuel Miranda fast tracks an early release of the original Broadway cast production to Disney Plus this Friday. Ooh. I know you've been very excited about this release, Ryan. Yes, I'm so, so, so excited. Um, you know, I've actually been looking forward to this um, since Lemon Manuel Miranda originally announced on February 3rd of this year that he was partnering with Disney for a theatrical release of uh, the film version of Hamilton. Um, and that was supposed to come next year on October 15th. And for our audiences, it's, it's not like a a movie they did they didn't like create a movie or anything but it's a cinematic version of the original broadway production so they filmed uh, about a, w a week before the original cast disbanded they filmed them performing the show and so they've through you know all the cinematic magic they've been able to create an experience so we can all see the original cast which is a very elitist thing in the broadway industry before this um but yeah so right before the pandemic that happened and in light of the pandemic miranda and disney uh, they got together and they decided to release the film 15 months early on Disney+. Plus. Um, I think they all knew that we needed something uh, to lift our spirits. Uh, I think Bob Iger even said on Twitter, if I have this right, in, the, in this very difficult time, the story of leadership, tenacity, hope, love, and the power of the people to unite against adversity is both relevant and inspiring. And hashtag Hamilton film. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know about you, Brenna, but I really think that Hamilton meets this moment like just the combination of history and how uh, of people rising up to make america as 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 best as it can be and to make a better nation for their neighbors and for their children i think that's been really inspirational and that's a really inspirational story to hear that that happened at when when they formed our country almost 250 years ago and to have have this musical really remind us of that moment now. I think that it's perfect for this moment. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, honestly, I feel like there are like just certain pieces of art that just like hit at the right time and it just takes off. And honestly, I think the themes within Hamilton and just the overall story and message have just you know, really been relevant, honestly, since the Broadway opening in 2015, like really the last five years of our country, like Hamilton's just been a story that we've needed. Yeah, I, I even think about the non-traditional casting. Um, and for our audiences, non-traditional casting, that's when a company casts ethnically and racially diverse uh, female transgender roles where race, ethnicity, and sex is not relevant to character or plot development. Um, but just the embrace, embracing that non-traditional casting um, to have actors of all different races and ethnicities play these historical figures, that, that's just been really poignant. And I think that has reflected the moment that we're in in the United States today and that national conversation of how do we, uh, how do we bring bring everyone up into uh, the America that we all want and love for, for all of us. Um, but yes, yeah, so if you can't tell, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm counting down the days until the digital release on July 3rd. But until then, I've been watching the new trailer, which we have queued up for you guys. And if you are as obsessed with Hamilton as I am, <laughs> I'm sure this is at least the 10th time that you've seen it. Wow, I have <laughs> like chills. Oh my gosh. Um, and for our Lead Center patrons, you might recognize a familiar face in that trailer. Leslie Odom Jr., who plays Aaron Burr in the original Broadway production, actually opened our 2018 2019 season with a cabaret show. It was amazing. One of the best shows I've ever seen. So you definitely will not want to miss him in the Hamilton recording that's coming out on Friday. And um, that that trailer, um, the song that's playing underneath, and then at the very very end, it's it's called "Satisfied," and it is my 
absolute favorite song from the show. It's sung by um, Hamilton's wife. Her name is, was, Eli Eli gosh, Eliza Schuyler. There we go. Um, and her sister Angelica was also very close with Hamilton. And so that song is sang from the point of view of Angelica. And so there's a song before Satisfied called Helpless. It goes through how Eliza and Hamilton met and then satisfied comes in and Angelica's singing it at their wedding and you'll see it in the um show so I won't spoil too much but um satisfied is an inverse of helpless so it basically rewinds and reveals a little bit more about the relationship between Angelica and Hamilton and um there's a little bit of a love triangle there Ooh, yes I I Brenna, I love satisfied as well and I think Renee uh, Renee Elise Goldsberry is queen and she was phenomenal at that role probably the best in my opinion um but you know satisfied <laughs> is one of those moments where I find myself wondering like how historically accurate this moment was depicted, right? I mean, these are very private and intimate relationships. There wasn't Twitter. And so uh, much of this history is, it's really based on conjecture and interpretation of, of, of really of letters that uh, people wrote and sent across the sea. And historians are just trying to kind of figure out what the, what the beef was, <laughs> what the drama was. So. I know that there's an infamous letter that Angelica sent to her sister Eliza, where she said, if you were as generous as the old Romans, you would lend him to me for a little while, talking about Alexander Hamilton. And actually in the song Helpless, which you were referencing just a bit earlier, Brenna, uh, Eliza Hamilton sings the line, laughing at my sister because she wants to form a harem. I'm just saying, if you really loved me, you would share him. So there is definitely something going on, even if, even if we don't know exactly what was going on today, um, I think Lynn Manuel Miranda was picking up on, on some of the Twitter beef that was going on in the late 1700s. Yeah, I, it definitely sounds like there was some romantic tension there. I personally am like an Angelica purist. Angelica is definitely my favorite <laughs> character from the show. And so like, I want the hope that like, there was nothing going on, you know, Angelica is gonna pick her family over anything else. Cause that's very much how uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda characterized her. So I'm hoping, I'm crossing my fingers, but you know, like you said, we don't know. Yeah, I I think just to like give you a little bit of hope there, Brenna, I did, I, I read the Sherno, uh, so for everyone who doesn't know, Hamilton was based, is based on the biography, 2004 biography that Ron Sherno wrote about um, Alexander Hamilton, Lemon Miranda picked up an airport, read it, fell in love with it. I, I read that, and he said he says that there's nothing that says that Angelica Hamilton actually had like any actual relationship with Alexander, and that it was probably just a lot of flirting. Um, and she did spend a lot of time um, not in the United States, so I think we can at least be hopeful about that and that she was true to her family in regards to that. But. You know, even though we can't quite say for sure what the exact nature of the relationship was, there are many parts of Hamilton's life that have been clearly preserved for posterity. And uh, our guest on the pod today has spent his entire professional career researching Alexander Hamilton's life and legacy. Brenna, do you want to introduce our viewers to Nebraska's in-home Hamilton expert? Sure. Dr. Carson Holloway is a renowned professor of political science at the University of Nebraska Omaha, a visiting fellow at Princeton University, and an expert on Hamilton. The man, not the musical, but he likes the musical. He's a big <laughs> fan. Um, he's written a ton of works on Hamilton's life and role as one of the founding fathers as well. Um, Ryan sat down with Dr. Holloway last week to talk about both the musical and the man, the short, the show's historical accuracy, and the Broadway production's impact on Hamilton's legacy. First off, as a Hamilton scholar, uh, what's your opinion on the Broadway musical? I mean, what do you think of the idea of basing a musical after one of the founding fathers? I think it's a great idea, and obviously it's been a tremendous success, and you can tell from the musical itself, and, and that it's not only a great idea, but a very well executed idea. And I'm really happy about it. It has, from my own personal standpoint, generated a lot of interest about Hamilton which may not have existed otherwise. In general, I'd like to see more of this kind of thing. I mean, my impression is Americans don't really know enough 
history and these works of entertainment, works of art can get them interested, whether it's musicals or like that John Adams miniseries from HBO, that's now about 15 years ago, um, or maybe historical novels. I say, go for all of it. So I'm happy with the musical and anything of that nature. That's awesome. The version of Alexander Hamilton that we see on stage is not, not exactly a complete portrait of the man in our history books, as you know, I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. but can you give our audience a rundown of some of the key moments of Hamilton's life uh, and role as a founding father? And for my sake, I'll tally up how many of those moments uh, Lemon and Miranda actually nailed and turned into songs. Sure. Um, Hamilton had a very interesting and difficult childhood. He grew up in the British West Indies, so down in the Caribbean. He was born on Nevis and then came up on St. Croix later on, and he was an orphan. Um, he was illegitimate because his mom ran away from her first husband and then took up with this character, James Hamilton. And I say he was orphaned, I guess, because first in the family, he ran off. So Rachel Fawcett or Rachel, yeah, that's her name from her first marriage. Rachel was the two boys, Hamilton and his brother. And then she got sick and died. Um, and Hamilton got this fever as well, but he survived. So he and his brother were left um, without any family really there was a number of deaths when they shifted them from one branch of the family to the other um so he ended up in the care of this family this businessman and he ended up his first i guess claim to fame in a narrow way was writing this letter uh for the newspaper down there in the caribbean which was uh an account of this hurricane that slammed the island and that he was only about 16 years old i think uh when he wrote that brought him to the attention of the businessman but, well, this is a talented young person. We should take up a collection to send him to North America to get an education. So from there, he came to uh, up to the colonies in North America and ended up going to Columbia, well, King's College in New York City. And from there, um, he quickly got drawn into the American Revolution. And then when the war started, he got drawn into uh, revolutionary service. And from there, I would, I was thinking about this, it's kind of easy to characterize his career, although it stands on own, but it's kind of easy to characterize it in relation to other founding fathers. So he quickly became the chief aide de camp to General Washington. So he was with Washington through much of the Revolutionary War. And then he left and had a chance to lead troops in battle a little bit at the end at the Battle of Yorktown. Um, and he goes off and is a lawyer in New York City for a few years and then gets drawn back in as one of the leading figures of the Constitutional Convention with James Madison, who's usually considered the father of the Constitution. And then he's pivotal in, so you could say so far as um, you know, being an aide to Washington, he was pivotal in securing American independence. Then he was pivotal in the writing and ratification of the Constitution, because after the Constitution was written, he embarked upon this project, the Federalist or the Federalist Papers, to write articles in defense of the Constitution to secure ratification, and he partnered with that, or in that, mainly with James Madison. Um, once ratification took place and Washington was elected president, Washington chose Hamilton to be uh, his Secretary of the Treasury. This is depicted in the, uh, in the musical, of course. Yeah. Um, and in that position, he was the prime motivator of a number of important policies that helped set the country on a proper financial footing um, and then, you know, that's kind of like the high point, I think, of his political career, because after he left Treasury, he no longer had the same kind of direct influence on politics. The end of the cabinet ministers under Adams, when Adams succeeded uh, Washington, and that's where some of the bad blood starts to appear. I mentioned his relationship to Adams as well. Um, I think Adams resented Hamilton's influence over his cabinet. He didn't like him that much. Um, and then... Hamilton had his doubts about Hamil or about Adams' character, and he wrote this big pamphlet in 1800 trashing him, which actually helped elect Jefferson to the presidency, even though Hamilton had big political differences with Jefferson and did not really want to see him as president. Um, and then after Jefferson was president, Hamilton wrote some more essays. He was very prolific in writing these journalistic essays about politics, both while he was in office and while he was out of office. So massive amounts of this stuff. Um, so he had one last foray in this piece called The Examination, where he criticized the early efforts of Jefferson's administration. And then, as you know, uh, his life was cut short by the duel with Aaron Burr, 
uh, based upon some of the things he'd said about Burr because he thought, um, Hamilton thought Burr was a dangerous man and not to be trusted with political power, which if I can go back for a moment, um, is why he ended up supporting Jefferson over Burr in 1800 to be president. It's, it's really funny because as, as you were talking through the history, I was, I, mean, I was thinking, I was like, okay, I, I, I heard like at least the structure of this. So based on your experience, you know, kind of listening to soundtrack and, uh, you know, just giving the rundown of Hamilton's life, um, how do you think he is or isn't represented in the musical? Do you think it's a fairly accurate representation? Yeah, I mean, it is, of course, uh, we would say an interpretation of Hamilton and his life, right? It's not a scholarly biography, and you could never accomplish that within the confines of the musical. And the musical aims to be entertaining and to dramatize things. So I think on terms of, the, or in terms of the big picture, the events that happen and the orientations, it's accurate. Um, there are just things that are dramatized in certain ways to add to the tension, I think. I a couple of things that come to my mind. Um, I mean, it seems to me that maybe in the musical, Aaron Burr looms larger in Hamilton's life than he really did. In other words, Miranda uses him as kind of a foil to, to highlight these stages in Hamilton's career. I'm not sure Burr was really, you know, hovering around at all these different moments, but looking back on it retrospectively, it's interesting dramatically to do that because he's the one who ends up being in the conflict that kills Hamilton. So yeah. there's an, an interest in linking him there. Speaking of accurate representation, um, I know one of the reasons the musical Hamilton was so impactful on Broadway was that um, it kind of challenged some of the stereotyping that is inherent in casting, especially um, in the professional industry. And it embraced mm -hmm. non-traditional casting for roles that were based on actual historical figures, which is a very different application of non-traditional casting than we're used to. Um, for our audiences, mm -hmm. non-traditional casting is when a company casts ethnically and racially diverse female and transgender actors in roles where race, ethnicity, or sex is not relevant to character or plot development. Um, so uh, Carson, what do you think of Lin-Manuel Miranda's decision to use non-traditional casting and uh, how do you think that decision has impacted the public's perception of Alexander Hamilton? Yeah, that, I thought it was really interesting and, and a very defensible move in terms of Hamilton's own thought. Here's what I'll say about that. Um, there's a passage in Washington Press, which is like his final statement to the American people before he left the presidency, which him draft. And I'm pretty sure Hamilton made this similar remark himself, but there's a passage in that where, because as I said before, Hamilton was very close aide and friend to Washington and helped him with some of these important state papers. But the passage says something like this, that um, it speaks of the community of interests of persons who live under the same government, right? In other words, I think Hamilton and probably all the founders, based upon the kind of government we have, it's not a nation state like other countries where ethnicity is very important to the nation. America's always been more of a, if I can use a political science term, a regime, right? It's a form of government, a democratic republic that can embrace people of different backgrounds, different culture, different religion. So keeping that in mind, and I go back into that remark from Washington's farewell address that you're all Americans. He says the country has a right to concentrate your affections. You should love your own country because as living under the same government, you have the same interests. So the country is capable of having citizens who are of diverse backgrounds. And in light of that understanding of America, I think it's interesting and provocative and creates thought to go back and recast these characters um, based upon different ethnicities than the actual historical figures were. Since the Broadway debut, um, Hamilton's character has become sort of an icon to many people who immigrated to the U.S. who feel that um, Hamilton showcases the impact that immigrants have had on the American experience. So mm -hmm. what do you think is the cultural impact of Miranda writing Hamilton as this immigrant hero? And from your own mm -hmm. research, would Alexander Hamilton have actually thought of himself as an immigrant? He identified with the country. You could say he's an American nationalist in the sense that he wanted America to be a great and powerful country. He wanted it to um, rise to the level of being equal to the European powers that he thought had dominated the scene for too long. He has some nice remarks about this 
in the Federalist, where he says, you know, they've thrown their weight around for a long time. Now we're going to make a great nation that can stand on its own. So there's something very nice about what Miranda is doing there, right? That Hamilton can come to America as an outsider and yet be totally committed to its interests, its prosperity, and its, its glory in a way, right? It wasn't just that he wanted the country to be powerful, but he wanted it to be respectable and, and honored among nations. Um, now, as this other interesting question as to whether he understood himself to be um, an immigrant, I actually had a colleague ask me about that a few years ago, and I think it's, there's a, to me, kind of interesting ambiguity there, because the friend asked me about it because he talked about it with a friend. These are professors, right? Colleagues in, the, in history or in political science. I'm a political scientist. Um, and so one had said to the other, well, Hamilton not really view himself as an immigrant. One British colony to another. So to that extent, he's not really an immigrant in the sense we think of today. But that prompted me to go back since they asked me the question and look at some of the easily searchable um, bodies of text and say, like, how did Hamilton use the word immigrant? How did some of the others use the word immigrant? I didn't do a comprehensive search on this. I didn't want to track that and reuse. But from the few I looked at, you could see that they used it in a rather loose sense to mean somebody who moved from one place to another. Um, so in fact, I remember seeing instances of referring to somebody as like a Scots immigrant. Well, if you're a Scot, you're under the British Empire too. So I think they did use the term in such a way, a loose sense, that he could have thought of himself as an immigrant because he didn't come originally from these colonies. And you know the colonies by the time of the revolution had developed a certain kind of identity as a group that had a certain set of interests. And so if you came in from the outside, you would be kind of an outsider and sometimes he was treated as an outsider. I think in, in his case too, it's interesting that because he didn't grow up here, he didn't have the same kind of local attachments that many Americans had. And as a result of that, he was more committed to the country as a whole, where I think he thought that sometimes the um, older style Americans were too connected to their states, right? They thought of themselves as Virginians or New Yorkers or Pennsylvanians, when they should have been thinking of themselves as Americans. That's, that, that's really, I, I think that's something that we all need now. You know, I, I've actually heard that uh, conversation just in the news media and among different politicians talking about that uh, concept. So it's clear from the show that, you know, Alexander Hamilton wanted, wanted. an impact on America. Like you said, um, he really wanted to make America as the best place it could be. He really wanted to uphold it and uh, contribute to its, its glory. Um, and so there's a really touching moment at the end of the show where um, they repeat the lyric, who lives, who dies, who tells your story, and it's repeated over and over again. And it's kind of revealed, at least in the idea of mm -hmm. in the construct of the show, that despite all of Hamilton's efforts to really make a lasting impact um, on America in his lifetime, um, it's his wife, Eliza mm -hmm. Hamilton, who really remembers him and upholds his legacy. So what, what do you think of this? Do you think this is an accurate kind of characterization of why Hamilton's legacy has endured? And, uh, you know, what is the impact of that legacy on America today? First of all, this idea of legacy is very important. Hamilton was pretty upfront about being a man who cared about fame, right? Um, there's a nice passage in the Federalist Papers where he talks about the presidency, an office he never occupied, but he, he talked about um, the love of fame as being the ruling passion of the noblest minds. Um, and elsewhere, like in his report on uh, the public credit, for example, which seems like kind of a boring topic, he flat out admits though that as Secretary of the Treasury, his desire for reputation is bound up with the uh, measures that he's recommending for the country. In other words, he wanted to be famous as a benefactor statesman who helped make the country. So I think it's important, and I do think it's the uh, musical depicts that his wife was very protective of his legacy, and she's the one who, after he died young, she lived a long time. She was still alive in the 1850s. Um, she did a lot to promote the memory of his work, encouraging the son to write the first big biography of Hamilton, for example, and keeping his papers and things like this. Um, so I think the country does owe something to her. But overall, this is a very conventional thing to say, but I think there's some truth in it. Um, you know, people tend to view 
America as having developed into a country that Hamilton would understand and appreciate because he was the one especially who wanted it to grow into a great commercial and manufacturing nation, which is what happened. You know, other people like Jefferson had visions of an agrarian republic where most people would be farmers. And certainly that was true for a long time in the 19th century, but um, gradually the country turned in the direction that Hamilton had in mind, manufacturing commerce and being a major power. Yeah, well then, you know, just from what you said, we have a lot to attribute to Hamilton. Um, I think so. <laughs> so um, we really appreciate uh, you joining us today, Carson. Dr. Holloway. Um, yeah. <laughs> you guys can find him at UNL. Um, but yes, so thank you for joining us today on the episode. Hello, everyone. Hi. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I really think that Carson had a lot of great things to say. Um, there was, he talked about a moment from Washington's presidential address, um, which Hamilton wrote. And it's really interesting because the lyrics in the song One Last Time are taken directly from that presidential address. So Lemon Miranda literally looked at the paper and took lyrics, took a uh, text from the late 1700s. And, and wrote that into a musical, which I think is really amazing today. But, um, you know, he talks about the community of interests of, person who live, of persons who live under the same government and um, how Washington uh, had the idea of, you know, you're all Americans and the country has a right to concentrate on your affections. You should love your own country because as living under the same government, uh, you have the same interests. And I think that's really poignant because even though it wasn't practiced, you know, we, ha we have to be honest, there was a free in the United States that we had an entire civil war because of it. Um, we haven't um, treated women well. We haven't integrated them into society for hundreds of years since, since the late, late 1700s. Um, equality for all people, the LGBTQ community, um, and, and even immigrants, you know, we haven't necessarily always fulfilled um, what that mission was, but it gives me hope uh, as an American, that 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 was the goal. That that is the goal. Because I, I, you hear a lot of talk about um, with the Supreme Court and everything. Like, what was what was the text? What was the original intention? And that's how we should live as Americans. Well, the original intention clearly was to to elevate everyone and to include everyone as a part of of American society because we all live under the same government. It gives me a lot of hope as. Um, you know, a son of, of immigrants who came to the United States because they wanted to be a part of America. Um, you know, they, they wanted to be part of this great, this great experience. And so that gives me a lot of hope with, with all the, you know, the protests with justice and policing and with uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the pandemic that we can come together and we can, we can make this country what it should be for all of us. Um, and like Hamilton said, we're not Nebraskans, we're not New Yorkers, Californians and Texans, we are Americans. And, and that's how we should live um, and taking care of our neighbors, you know, masking up, um, standing up for what's right when you, standing up for the people who live in your community. That's, that's what they did in the late 1700s. And that's why Hamilton is still relevant today, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we definitely all can learn something from Hamilton, both you know, as you know, this whole entire podcast is all about both the man and the musical. Um, it, like I said earlier, there's just some times where a piece of art comes out and it hits so well for what a country is going through. And I think, yeah, definitely Hamilton is kind of that movement that we've needed over the past couple of years. So I definitely agree with everything you said, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brenna. I mean, well, I just hope that that's, that's what people take from this. And I want you guys to all go watch Hamilton on Disney Plus this Friday and, and, and really embrace some of those, um, those ideals because you know our founding fathers weren't perfect, um, but they had some positive intentions in mind. So let's act on that, hopefully, um, as we go through this time in our country together. Um, but you know, as you guys may know, we're gonna end every Lunch and Learn episode with a short segment of what we're watching this week. So you can tune in on some of the best content that the industry has to offer. 
Um, but so besides Hamilton on Disney Plus, which I'm going to be staying up till midnight this June Thursday to watch, I want to close <laughs> off June. <laughs> I, I will, I promise. Um, I want to close off June with a happy Pride Month to all, especially since most of the normal festivities have been canceled. Um, and I'm begging you all to watch the new series on Hulu, Love, Victor. I binged it in a single night. The episodes are only about 30 minutes each. And I'm kind of mad at myself for doing that because season two isn't coming until 2021 because of uh, delays in production for the reasons we all know, the pandemic. Um, but the show is from the team behind the LGBTQ coming age film, Simon. And it follows the story of Victor, a 16 year old boy trying to figure out his place in the world and discovering along the way that human sexuality, this is a quote, is less of a straight line and more of a Cirque du Soleil show. Uh, long, confusing and full of sexy clowns. So <laughs> if you're interested in that, <laughs> you should definitely go check that out. <laughs> but how about you, Brenna? What are you watching this week? Okay, I'm definitely behind the power curve on this one. I keep on going back to the live stream that Broadway.com did for Stephen Sondheim's 90th birthday. Um, for those of you who don't know, Sondheim is a super influential musical theater composer who has written musicals such as like Sweeney Todd, Into the Woods, and I am the biggest Sondheim fan and I think he's absolutely brilliant and this live stream features some of his best works sung by stars such as Neil Patrick Harris, Meryl Streep, Jake Gyllenhaal, our good friend Lin-Manuel Miranda, and my personal idol Miss Patti Lapone. If you need an introduction to Sondheim, this is the introduction for you. A full record of the broadcast is available on Broadway.com's YouTube channel. Yeah, well, Brenna, I didn't know you were such a Sondheim fan. Um, but, I love yeah, Sondheim. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't get a chance to check it out, but I'm going to check it out now because you told me to. Um, but yes, if you guys enjoyed spending time with us today, um, we encourage you to donate to the Lead Center's COVID-19 Relief Fund to ensure that the arts and programming like this remain an essential part of the Lincoln community that we've all come to love. Um, so you can find the donation link on our website, www.leadcenter.org. And I think that about wraps up our premiere episode of Lunch and Learn at The Lead. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you Tuesday, August 4th at noon for the next Lunch and Learn.